Hi everyone. Thanks for joining us today on AGL Live where we're going to talk the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services. Um, I want to invite our viewers to use the Q&A icon to ask questions. You're going to find that at the top right corner of the viewing window. You're going to click on the icon with the little boxes and then there'll be a Q&A icon. There. From there you will your questions and click Submit. So we're going to start with brief introductions. I'm Elizabeth Raley, Director of Professional Services at Civic Actions. I'm a practicing Scrum Master and also on the steering committee of AGL. I'm moderating the session and I'm going to pass to Rob next. Services Administration in the federal government. I'm currently trying to start a charity of my own called Public Invention for All Humanity. And uh, it's a great pleasure of me to be interviewing Mark Schwartz, who uh, uh, I interacted with and to be a great pioneer of the use of Agile in the federal government. Well, wow. um, introduce yourself. I'll introduce you. I'm Mark Schwartz. I'm the CIO at U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, which is one of the components of the Department of Homeland Security. I've, I've been there for about five years now, so I finally learned a little bit about how procurement and HR work in the government. I'm very proud of myself for that. Great. All right, Rob, let's start with our first question. Well, and um, that's exactly what we want to talk about today. And I'm sure some of the audience is really interested in some of the um, innovative things you've done with contracting. But my first question is, um, Mark, you've been a real leader in the federal government in the uh, for five years. Can you explain um, the scope of the teams that you're using, this, the size of the teams, and the basic methodology that you insist upon? Sure. Uh, so first of all, everything we do in terms of software delivery is agile in one form or another. We're using a mix of Scrum and Kanban, uh, focused on moving towards more of a DevOps model, uh, putting in place continuous delivery systems, and um, uh, trying, trying to rework or realign our federal staff and our contractor staff around a model like that. So it takes a little bit of time. We have uh, a very major program that we're using a, a DevOps and continuous delivery model for, and then two others as well. And uh, we're working on shifting just about everything over. We have about 75 legacy that we're building. So we're going to deal with all the complications of moving legacy code into a framework, uh, but we're, we're eager to start really tackling those challenges. Um, there are people doing it with much smaller teams um, than what you're working with as a sub-agency. Um, what have been the results um, that you were getting using this Agile methodology, and perhaps you could talk about how long it took you to Mm -hmm. Our team sizes are small. When you say larger teams, you, you, uh, what you're is two people, two pizza teams. Uh, and we have as many as about, depending on how you count them, about count them about 15 teams working in parallel on the same code base for one of our programs. So that's, that's the uh, largest one so far. Uh, the results, continuous delivery, right now we're actually deploying to production about once a week and we are working on what will let us go more frequently than that. Right now our deployments take us probably about an hour or so, and we're moving in the production environment, if you're familiar. And uh, once we have that in place and a couple of other things in place, we'll probably try pushing it to see how frequently we can deploy, although the once a week cycle is, is quite good for our needs. So we might wind up sticking with that, at least for that program. We That's have, very, yep, 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 sorry, go ahead. Let me clarify, what have been your overall results in terms of the productivity of your department? Yeah, uh, well, the most important thing to me really has been the reduction in cycle time. That's, of, of all things, that's what I'm fighting for the most. I figure uh, if we look at the total, actually lead time is probably a better term for it, I'm looking at the time from a mission need to a deployed capability. The agency feels like it needs something. How long does it take us to get something into production to satisfy that need? And I think in the past, we've been content the, across the federal government with lead times that are on the order of years, you know, five, ten years even. 
What I'm looking to do is shrink that time to the absolute minimum. Uh, so the best way I can measure that is in our transformation program, the large program that I'm talking about, as we've had changing agency needs, we're working against a, a set of requirements that has been in place for a while. So we say our, our cycle time has been fast on those. But as changes have come through, as, as things have happened in Congress or in the White, um, different priorities within the agency or, or whatever it is, we've been able to turn on a dime and start releasing code uh, pretty much immediately. I'll say about one, uh, one week cycle time, let's say, because our deploys are every week. Maybe it's taking a little longer than that. Um, in terms of productivity, it's hard to measure. What we're looking for really is continuous improvement. So if we look at the same teams from sprint to sprint, are we getting more done? Are we getting it done at a higher level of quality? Uh, are we removing some of the impediments based in the process. And I'd say anecdotally we've seen um, we've seen the same teams working in our environment before we had afterwards as we started to do that. And we we certainly have seen an increase in productivity. But I don't have metrics for you quite yet because we've really just rolled out the continuous months. Thank you very much. Um, so we have a question from Ben Morris that I'm going to delay just one second to let Mark ask a, a, a more general question, and then we'll answer. Uh, we'll ask Ben's question. Um, I, I think one of the most creative things that you personally have done is to arrange the contracts so that they are both agile and highly incent the contractors. And I guess we should clarify that. Um, you have a technical staff, but it is still the case that a majority of the programmers working on your staff are, in fact, contractors. They are not federal employees. Um, and I think uh, many people are in the situation that you're in, uh, even who are not CIOs but are program managers, in the sense that um, they're trying to build teams of contractors and get them to um, be incentive to perform in an agile way very um, uh, uh, productively. Uh, mm -hmm. So ha what structure do you use? I'm with a new structure. I'm very happy with the way that it's worked out. This is specifically for our transformation program where we're uh, really replacing one large systems integrator contractor with a number of other contractors and breaking it down so that the full government employees are very us while it's still the contractors who are doing the development work. So it's a very uh, tight, really, really has a lot of interesting aspects to it. It's been, it's been fascinating to roll it out and work. We have what we're calling our FADS contract vehicle, our flexible agile development services. And it's a contract for agile development teams with certain skill sets but without stated upfront requirements or there are contractual Requirements, but there aren't system requirements, which I think is an important distinction. We are we, we awarded this to four different contractors. It's not exactly a BPA, but it has a lot of the characteristics of a BPA. And the idea is we started with two teams from each contractor. These are nine-person teams, including developers and testers, uh, or development skills and test skills, I should say, because we allowed the contractors to decide exactly how to compose their teams. But we said the teams are responsible for development and for uh, testing their own code and making sure that it's that is high quality. We had other testing as well uh, afterwards. Um, we started with two teams from each contractor, intending to increase our total number of teams. But at the end of each of the option periods, we choose how many teams to get from each of the contractors. So if the contractor is given teams and they're both performing very well and we're happy with what we're seeing, we think they can create a third team, then we might order a third team, a fourth team, a fifth team from them. If they're not performing so well, or we think maybe only one of their two teams is performing, we can reduce the number of teams, reduce it down to zero ultimately. So the contractors have an incentive to try to get future business from us by showing us that they can do a great job. And interestingly, the contractors they all think that they're better than the others, uh, and they want to prove it to us. They want to show us and win our our work by show. Uh, but uh, an interesting aspect this is this is where it really gets into the um, complexities is 
don't want the contractors fighting with each other, pointing fingers with each other, you know, uh, being competitive in a bad way. We want them to be competitive. So we do a, a monthly evaluation of them. We give them a, a lot of feedback, but on a formal basis, once a month, we review their performance with them uh, along a number of dimensions. And one of those dimensions is how well they collaborated with the other contractors' teams. So we've made it clear that that's an important priority for us. If they are programming whiz, whizzes, but they can't do a good job of working in an environment where there are multiple contractors, then we don't really want to keep getting teams from them. Uh, it turned out to be easier to, to get them to think that way than I would have expected. What we find is, uh, I, I actually should have explained this before, uh, we're buying nine-person teams and almost no management overhead. So for as many nine-person teams as we have from the contractor, they also supply us one project manager and one technical lead, and that's it, nobody else. So the people who are actually working together, co-located in a single space, are actually technical people for the most part. They're testers. They love what they're doing, and they love working together in teams and producing results. So to tell them that they had to call, it wasn't a stretch for them because they're you know, technical people. They love doing that kind of thing. So uh, we found that the, the contractors have been super collaborative, uh, I'll often walk into a meeting where somebody will say, oh, we have this really difficult problem, and one of the contractors will jump up and say, let us work on that one. We'd like to help out with that. We think we could do a great job. So uh, fascinating results. The one thing I will add to that is we have other contractors in the ecosystem, again, with a lot of checks and balances uh, to make the whole thing function as a unit. We have independent testers validate that the testing that's going on in the development teams is uh, and also do a little bit of testing on their own. We have a code integration team that's responsible for the health of our continuous integration pipeline and our deployments. We deploy into the Amazon cloud right now. So uh, they set up teams that are also doing some code reviews, sort of auditing the quality of the code watching the process and reporting back to me as sort of independent verification and validation. But we try to keep those things out of the, so that they're not holding anything up, they're not gatekeepers, but they are looking for systemic issues that we can address as well. So that's how the, the whole ecosystem fits. Everybody, how important this is, but many, many people in the federal government right now are trying to figure out how to do what you have just described. Um, and I describe it this way, you purchase functional teams and trying to make detailed requirements. And um, for those of you who are familiar with the, the federal traditions, which are not necessarily regulations, but they're traditions of how you do contracting, the switch from detailed requirements to a functional team that's going to be in an agile way is a, is a great mind shift, which, by the way, has also been advocated by Tracy Walker of the uh, Office of Management. Um, so I'm sure we'll have a chance to talk about that a little bit more, but let me uh, talk now about Ben Morris's question. I don't think, Mark, you can see this. Uh, ben asked, what sort of contracting models do you use? Specifically, do you use all time and material contracts or also fixed price contracts? Um, and I know to some extent your answer has to be taken in the context of what you just described of using multiple teams in a certain way. The structure that we found works well for this um, although we, we should experiment a little bit more before I actually say that, but we're using cost plus fixed fee. There is, first of all, we've used cost, we've used an award fee in previous contracts, uh, and it just hasn't been all that effective. We, we find that uh, if the contractor has the skills, they do great. If they don't have the skills, it's hard to make them get the right skills. Uh, also, I think award fees, and I'll probably say this in, in other ways as we continue talking, uh, it's awards on whether they deserve the award fee, and we had an award fee board that had to have meetings. I'm trying to make the process as lean as possible and cut as much out of it as I can. So we decided not to go in the, in the direction of award fees or incentives. Uh, that leaves a few options, I think. There's time and materials, cost plus fixed fee, uh, maybe firm fixed price. What you're buying essentially is a certain amount of capacity from teams, and all of those I didn't want the contractors to feel like they had to lowball the price. 
you know, the, the I figure what makes this successful is hiring really, really good developers. And uh, my fear was that if we did time and materials, contractors would think that they had to blow and then go out and try to hire people at a low at a low rate, and we wouldn't be getting the top performers. So uh, could be working very well for us, and uh, I would recommend it. But we're using different models for other like um, they don't have access to a vehicle that necessarily allows them to do that. Um, and it sometimes takes an agency a long time, a year or more, to shift to a vehicle that allows the kind of structure that you're talking about. Um, and it really requires creativity, but also on the contract officers and the people who are uh, working on that to sometimes put that in place. I, I would say, um, maybe to, to advance the thought a little bit further, a lot of different things can work, but what I, I really don't development process, and I know that uh, there are people who will disagree with me on this, but a contract that says what the requirements for the system are going to be uh, and requires delivery against those requirements, that is not going to work. Right. So a firm fixed, price uh, firm fixed price contract that has a firm fixed price for a set of requirements is not the right way to go for an, an agile process, in my opinion. Other right. things can work. In the federal government, that firm fixed price is a risk reducing mechanism. And I think that's completely specious. It, it, yeah, it reduces it's, it's, the risk of, of you know, <laughs> that you ask for, but what you ask for is likely to be incorrect. So you're not yeah. increasing customer satisfaction. Strategy, in my opinion, because the real thing in over specifying, right. we know that it's going to two thirds of your features rarely or never used. Right. And so creating that kind of a contract is essentially saying we definitely want to lose two thirds of our money. You know, that's a right. pretty serious risk there. Right. Right. And of course we owe it to the American people to do a better job with that. Um, before I move on to Henry's question, I would just like to point out to our audience that um, this is the third episode of Agile Gov Leadership Live. Um, Mark is a important employee, but we do welcome our state and local government uh, employees as well. Um, some of the things we're talking about here are to the federal government, but the basic ideas that Mark is talking about, about having functional teams that are potentially incentivized to do it with and cooperating with each other uh, is fundamental to agile practice in, in any uh, line of work. Uh, so Henry Poole, who is the leader of Civic Actions, uh, asked the question, um, do you have any metrics on team satisfaction? I'm curious if people are happier in jobs using Agile. Uh, question for us. Since the developers are all contractors, it's not necessarily something that we're directly observing. What we do is try to get as much feedback going back and forth with the teams as we can. I mean, Personally, as does the, the head of the transformation program, we meet regularly with the leads of each team. And one of the biggest questions in this is what impediments can we remove? What's not working for you? What can we do to help you be more productive uh, or, or be happier in the work environment? And we collect ideas from them, and then we go try to you know, hammer down each of those impediments as quickly as we can. Among the federal employees, I would love to know um, if there's more satisfaction. I think maybe it's a little bit early for us to, to try that out. Anecdotally, it's sounding good, but uh, I don't have any metrics yet. Okay, well, thank you. I asked one technical question about the way you do things. Um, I've always used story point estimation, and I've had good success with it, but I, uh, and I would was taught it by Kent Beck, but I later heard that you have a mechanism for doing estimation of your stories, and of course, you don't have a detailed requirements document. So could you please talk about how you do stories? This goes to one of the points I made before about trying to uh, remove. Uh, so we're, we're constantly looking at our process and saying, what are the things we're doing that we don't really need to be doing, that we're not uh, getting as much value as we should be, and how can we simplify what we're doing. So story points went away at, at a certain point when we realized that 
there's a lot of potential for gaming the system when you're working with story points. Uh, contractor, let's say, is really motivated. I, I, I won't say they're doing this, but if they're not, I would be surprised that they would want to estimate or tend to estimate a higher. Looks like they're getting more work done. Uh, so the with so much potential to game the system, I was wondering whether there's actual value to it. I think the, the critical value you hope to get from story point estimation is it helps you figure out your capacity. When you go into a sprint, you want to try to figure out approximately the right amount of work to accept into the sprint. I've found that teams don't hit exactly that number. They're going above, they're going below. So it has to be a very approximate number. And story point estimates, for me, pretend to have more precision than they actually do in terms of figuring out what capacity is. I think it, it works just how the teams review the stories or the stories at the beginning of the sprint and approximate you know, how many of them they think they can do. With a, a huge program like we have with transformation and a lot of stories, and we made an effort to get the stories to be so there aren't really big stories or really small stories. It works just as well for us to estimate in terms of the number of stories rather than story points for each story. Now, you know, some, sometimes we'll be off a little bit, but on the whole, it, it kind of washes out over, over a long period of time. Right. Well, Agile, in my opinion, is all about guidelines and not rules. So if it's here, uh, I'd like to um, ask Stefan Glomazik. Uh, he says, 18F is planning to do tech challenges as the key tech evaluation factor. And I assume he's talking about the Agile blanket purchase agreement with Chris Cairns um, has recently set up, not anything to do with the U.S. directly. Uh, will you start using that as well? And let sorry, me sorry, Rob. Rob, can you back up a little bit? I, I so, um, Stefan is asking a question about something that 18F is doing on a blanket purchase agreement to um, get people onto the blanket of purchase agreement, which is to do tech challenges. And so if I can generalize his question a little for the USCIS, um, how would you feel in upcoming years or contracts of tech challenges as a way to select vendors for your organization? Um, I, I really want to get a feel for working with a contractor before I make a selection. But um, this is an area where I need the advice of contracting professionals um, before I take a strong position, let's say. Or it, de it depends a lot on exactly how it's learned, I've learned. Uh, and I like to have the contracting professionals with me when I try to figure out wh where and how it's appropriate. We are moving more towards doing technical demonstrations in the uh, government process. We did that for some of the contract in this transformation program, and we're about to do it with a few other contracts. We learned a lot from doing it. We, we really got to know the contractors much better. Um, so I think the idea of GS of having a vet list, it's also a matter of making sure the contractors understand what skills we're looking for. I'm sure that if you think of it as a test, I'm sure they could arrange to pass the test at some point by changing what sort of people they hire and what their processes look like. And since one of our challenges is making sure the contractor community has the skill set that we need, I really like it as a way of communicating what the hurdle is, you know, or, or what exactly we're looking for before we want to enter a contractor. And I'll comment um, that some agencies are in a very different situation than you are in, in that they have much smaller um, projects and they don't have established relationship with vendors and they need to select vendors and a technical challenge is a great way to uh, promote Agile as a way to save money for the U.S. taxpayer as, as I've heard you do on a number of occasions. Greg Ellen writes, mark requirements of what needs to be derived and I certainly agree with that, are other government CIOs on board with that? Second part, what would he say to gov CIOs who say that waterfall is the only way to guarantee delivery on time? Uh, let me take the second of those first because I think it's really easy. Waterfall is the best way to guarantee late delivery, not agile approaches are the only way to guarantee on time delivery. 
Now, that, that requires a little bit of unpacking. Um, the way I think about it, an agile approach is a lot like working on a budget. You say, here's the amount of time we have, here's our time box, and part of what we have to do is manage the requirements to make sure that we can finish within this time box. So we have a fixed budget, we have a fixed schedule, and we uh, know that you can't obey the triple constraint. You can't, you know, you can't do everything. That use that, and then you have to let the scope vary. And an agile will allow you to do exactly that. On the other hand, a waterfall approach puts you in a position where you say this is the fixed scope, and you don't find out with any degree of accuracy whether you're going to hit your deadline or not based on that fixed scope. So as you get close to the deadline, you realize you don't have a complete system and it hasn't met your fixed scope, the only choice you have at that point is to go over budget because you don't have anything unless you do that. So I, I think of Agile as working within a budget and Waterfall as high risk that you won't be able to. And so uh, I, I completely agree with that and obviously Agile Gov leadership as an organization is dedicated to that uh, concept. Um, but Greg asked, are other CIOs on board with that? Um, that's obviously a very other CIOs in the federal government uh, are changing their minds about this or feel about it today. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the appeal of agile approaches to other CIOs in the government, I, I think the thing that's really appealing to them is more what we think of as lean. They, they want to get waste out of the process. They know there's a lot of waste in the way that they're doing things, that you can mitigate risk and reduce waste by having short feedback cycles, by delivering incrementally um, to federal CIOs, and I hope to the oversight community as well, because this is, this is what we're all looking for, is ways to manage, manage risk and reduce waste in our process. Those aspects, easy to convince everybody of, I think. Um, the harder part is uh, convincing everybody that it's important to work with small batch sizes, this is a, a key in principle, that you need to have small programs, not large programs. Large programs are more likely to fail. Uh, stack up a bunch of requirements before you start working you have to pay attention to the amount of your work in process or, or your batch size, what, you know, how much do you need to get done, uh, and move more towards a model where things flow into it. You know, that's, that's sometimes counterintuitive, uh, not clear necessarily. And corresponding to that, I think, is the question of requirements and whether you can know ahead of time what your requirements are. A lot of people still aren't convinced that you can't surface all your requirements in advance. Uh, I don't know if I'd say majority government CIOs. I think uh, government CIOs are learning a lot these days and understanding that better and better. But the oversight community maybe hasn't quite caught up with that. The, uh, my thought at this point is what we have to do is propose a new model for how you oversee or how you do governance over programs. The old model was based on that fixed scope, IVNV, independent verification validation, that says, did you accomplish all of the requirements you started with? Did you do it on schedule? That, that whole model is not the right way to oversee projects. And uh, I'm, using, I'm using oversight in a broad sense to apply to those as well. You know, they have, to, they have to exercise governance over their portfolios. So there is a model for oversight and governance that does make a lot of sense uh, because we, we know because the point of our agile process is to reduce risk, reduce cost, and all of those things. So these are all, these are all positives. Everybody can agree. Uh, but that model has to, has to take into consideration things like the amount of value delivered and the amount of time it was delivered in. It has to take into account celebrating successes rather than looking for failures. It's all about, uh, the way I would oversee a program is, you've been at this for six what have you delivered? And if you can tell me that you've delivered a lot of good stuff that's adding a lot of value, I'm happy and, you know, I think you're a great program. You know why and how we're going to make changes to the program so that you will in the future. Right. 
um, in the words of someone else said this, I can't remember who it was, what we really need is to rack up enough successes that five or ten years from now, instead of being called before Congress and that document that's 50 pages long, CIOs like you are asked, why didn't you use X? To sort through all of the questions here, Frank McNally asked, um, and it's related to the notion of system requirements documents and how you write stories. What is your process for product roadmap? Is this a pre-award effort, part of the proposal process, or something that you do after award? To me, it's on a, a different schedule. Uh, since, since it's not going to influence what contractor I select and it's not going to influence the scope of the contractor's work, uh, it can happen on its own schedule. Product road mapping should be happening. You should have product owners or other people involved who are looking at the road map. Uh, things that are in the dis distant future, you should be sketching out at a high level. Things that are going to be worked on soon should be thought about on a more detailed level. All of that is completely separate from the contracting process, I think, in, in the, at least the approach to Agile I'm talking about. Does that answer the question? I have a feeling there was something else in there I missed. Uh, I, I think I'd like to go on because we've got a lot of time. We've been talking okay. a lot about we don't have a lot of time, I'm sorry. We've been talking a lot to juggle the requirements a little bit. We have a one hour sprint to get as many questions <laughs> as we can. Um, we've been talking a lot about contracting and we can come back to that. But I've also been impressed with um, something that, that we at 18F copied from you, which our 18F Consulting did, which is to use insist on good technical practices from your vendors. And you've already touched on integration as being perhaps the most um, give a chance for you to talk technical practices um, which may address some of the um, other questions that have come up. So let me read one. Are cloud services for the success that your teams have had? And what considerations are there for the use of Evolves. Uh, what, I, what I don't want to do is lock down a set of practices and, and say this is what good technical practices are. I'm the contractors can bring to me contemporary ideas, right? I, I want them and I want my federal employees out learning what the best ways are of doing things now. And in six months, there's probably going to be a different set of best practices. Uh, when we started all of these things a few years ago, continuous delivery and DevOps weren't really on my radar. But now, as I've been learning more and more and working with them more and more, I think of them as essential technical practices. I can't see going back to the way we were doing things a couple of years. A lot of automated testing. Uh, testing pyramid, where there are a lot of small tests or a lot of unit tests, a smaller number of integration tests, you know, and a, a small number of uh, cross-function tests, end-to-end -end tests, user, uh, user interface level tests. Continuous integration is a critical technical practice to me now. And uh, to get to Cliff's question, uh, automated deployments. I think automated deployments, automated provisioning of infrastructure are uh, It doesn't really have to be the cloud. In theory, you can have virtualized infrastructure in your own premises, or you can have a private cloud, public variety of different kinds of public clouds. But what I think is critical is the virtualized infrastructure. You could be standing up your infrastructure, testing it. Infrastructure is code, testable infrastructure. And doing it rapidly, frequently, being able to tear it down uh, for cost reasons, if nothing else. We should be able to stand up an environment, do our testing, let's say, tear down the environment anymore. So to me, these are all critical technical practices, the critical practices will be. So let me I completely agree with that. It, it is not cloud services per se which are, are important, but it is the ability to quickly stand up an environment to test with. Uh, how you achieve that by hook or by crook is, uh, is less Rob, I don't know if you can hear me, but I've lost sound. I've lost audio. I can't hear you. Are you? Yeah. Mark, this is what I was um, saying here. So from my it's like you're frozen, Mark, so we might be losing a little bit. One uh, of the most important, no, you're back. One of the most important uh, 
aspects in it of technical agile, in my opinion, is to get a lot of user experience feedback as quickly and early in the cycle as possible. I believe you've already said that, although you didn't focus on the user experience per se, but just deploying software to see if it works early in, in the cycle. Um, can you talk about, do you guys go all the way to the end user, which in, in some cases, I know as the US citizen, the, the, um, the human being seeking to become a US citizen in some cases for your agency, and in general, what advice trying to take advantage of user experience feedback? For us, it's, it's actually a complicated issue. When the users are inter government employees, which is a lot of what we do, we get constant user feedback. It's, it's important to us. We start it early in the program as often as possible. When so it comes to getting... Does it really mean on a sprintly basis? Do you do it every... We have, uh, well, we have end users working with our development teams. We, we do detail people in from our field locations to work with the teams. But we also have regularly scheduled end, end user test sessions where we work a little bit more, more with them on how they're going to test it and make sure we exercise everything that needs to be exercised, that kind of thing. Um, when it comes to external users, it gets complicated. There is the Paperwork Reduction Act process. Uh, there are some legal considerations. We can't uh, essentially show favoritism, letting them in on trials, you know, things like that. I don't understand all of the legal issues involved. Uh, so we, we haven't always been able to do as much of that as we would like to. We're working on ways to do it more. But one thing that we found works really well for us is sort of a, a soft launch where when we think we're pretty close, we can put something out for people to use, maybe have a uh, trial people who are just using the system for the first time. We let them use our, our new version of it, uh, and then we come from that and incorporated it. I think what uh, some companies are doing that I really wish we could emulate, we will someday, is the ability to randomly present the, in a sort of A-B testing, uh, randomly present new features to a certain number of users, collect metrics on how well that works, and then make decisions about how to how to roll those features out to the rest of the public. Right, aggressive in um, in that respect. And for those of us who are not government, let me just point out, um, Mark is mentioning a number of bureaucratic impediments to doing some of the things that don't exist for Silicon Valley firms or firms in a situation. Uh, but uh, now I need to come back because our audience has upvoted a question which is very much a federal question. It concerns uh, FISMA, the Federal Information Security Management Act, which for those of you who don't know um, is a process. It's not necessarily a technical process. It's more of a bureaucratic process for security of government sites. And I'll read this question from Greg Ellen. In the contracts you have set up, who has responsibility for FISMA compliance? How do you do compliance in an automated agile environment? I love the question. Thank you, Greg. Um, my contention really is that we can improve our security posture dramatically by moving down this continuous delivery road. Uh, you have to think about our security now. Is it, it is it making you comfortable? You know, do do we feel like we're well secured? And, and I think we have a lot of unease, and it's well deserved unease. Uh, I think the old models for security are breaking down. So what we can do? Uh, I'll get back to the responsibility question in a second. But in a continuous sort of setup, we do automated tests. So they're writing rugged code to begin with. They understand what SQL injection attacks are and, and so on and uh, know that they have to try to avoid leaving those vulnerabilities. In addition to the static code analysis, uh, on a weekly basis or three times a week, also running a full suite of security tests on the, uh, as it's being developed. So uh, I think the same tools that we're using for continuous monitoring in production, we're also running on code in development now on a regular automated basis. When 
code is deployed, continuous monitoring, and we have triggers just in case a vulnerability uh, appears. And with a continuous delivery system, we know that we can redeploy the system with a change very, very quickly. So our time to respond to vulnerability is detected as much lower in this continuous delivery environment. Uh, and when we do respond, we have to try to patch up a system that might have been compromised. We can deploy into an entirely new set of virtual machines and wipe out the old one you know, with these, these new ways of doing things. Uh, to improve security. Uh, so I think the, the potential, you know, FISMA needs to start taking into consideration all of these models and requiring a lot of this, I think. Yeah, uh, it was written 10 or 12 years ago. Yeah, and Mark, in my opinion. I, th I think it sets up the right parameters, although um, uh, one thing I found is that we're not doing a lot of threat modeling that is specific to applications being developed, and I'd like to see a lot more of that built into the process. You know, how can, how can a malicious player fool the application logic into doing things that it shouldn't be doing? Right. And creating abuser stories and doing, doing a certain kind of penetration testing around that. I'd love to see a lot more of that. In terms of responsibility, the government, of course, is responsible for everything. Uh, especially in this case where the government is working alongside the contractors and is prioritizing requirements for them. So I think it's up to the government to make sure the security control requirements make it into the development pipeline and uh, that the appropriate testing is being done, that I've got independent validation even, that uh, part of the testing suite is adequate security testing and so on. So ultimately responsible for FISMA compliance. You are asking your vendors to make you secure enough that you feel comfortable signing that, uh, which um, you know could get you hauled before Congress if something bad were to happen in the future, right? Yes, uh, we do do independent testing as well, though. So um, if they are allowing bad stuff through, we will find it. But okay. ultimately, there are there are. And I'm expecting my contractors to write good, rugged code and to do enough testing and peer code reviews that uh, they're pretty sure they're not introducing vulnerabilities. Right. Uh, those of you who haven't submitted questions, you could submit one and try to squeeze time at the end for Mark to give advice to um, program to climb already risen on a little bit. Um, ben Morris asks, to adopt Agile, did you make any organization changes slash restructuring to better align responsibilities? Is that practically a prerequisite for government agencies to adopt Agile? You know, adopt Agile. Start doing it now. Do it incrementally. Right. Uh, I, I think preconditions for peace or what, you know, it sounds right. like a big Start down the road right away. Um, uh, Yes, organizational changes I now feel necessary, but um, to get the basic practice going, no, I don't think so. So uh, let, let me let me change the question because you've already answered that. You know, you've been working at USCIS for five. You have everything perfectly the way you wanted it when you started out. You just dove in and fixed both the bureaucratic problems and the systematic problems while you were developing the technical things and working on contracting mechanisms. And you attacked all of those problems more simultaneously, right? Yeah, and uh, I certainly wouldn't claim that we figured everything out five years ago when I started and it's just been a matter of doing it. We have been learning, we've been making mistakes, we, we've been improving our practice, and that's the way you have to do it, I think. Um, organizationally, the only change that I think is important is we have to start moving towards a DevOps model where we have teams that are uh, skilled in both development and operations and security and Section 508 compliance. Uh, this is accessibility for people with disabilities. Um, all of these things. And it's hard to fit that into a siloed IT organization that has an operation department, uh, software development, and 
a security department, right? You have to figure out how to make cross-functional teams between those silos. That does become increasingly important, but you can still get a, a good part of the way down the, the Agile path without restructuring. Right. Okay, so I'd like to ask one more question um, before we give you a chance to talk about advice to people who would like to emulate what you've been doing. Um, when I was in h &F Consulting, many of the things we were asked to do were, were legacy systems. It's very common in the federal government to have a legacy system. Uh, I believe you're dealing with a, a lot of that as well. Um, what advice do you give those working on legacy systems where there's a large code base which is not equipped with a test suite? And which, and, you know, seems, seems very difficult to begin using an Agile process on a, this monstrous monolithic legacy code base. The legacy code base is the what you're trying to do with it. I think the mistake we make is we say we want a modernization and modernization of it, and that's the mistake. Uh, what we have to do is tackle it and move towards your, your future state in an incremental sort of way. But that's what you have to do. A big bang replacement of the system will not be effective. One of the reasons why it won't be effective is that you can't deploy product to users until you've matched the functionality of the legacy system. And that will probably take you a long time to do. And that means you're not deploying incrementally and getting feedback and all the other things that are so wonderful in an app process. Um, there's a great book called Working Effectively with Legacy Code that I think tackles a lot of these issues. Uh, makes this great statement that the, the definition of legacy code is code that doesn't have automated... T really good point to that. I think uh, to, to work with the legacy code base, find a way to break it into pieces where you can release new things built on a new architecture incrementally and constantly, and um, you have to start bringing it under automated test as you're doing that. So you have to figure out what are the key risk areas as you, as you break apart this piece and start working with it. Um, how can you make sure that you're not changing the behavior of the system because what you want to do is modernize the architecture or, or some other goal. So you want to hold one thing constant while you, you change other things, so behaving the way it was before, and this architectural change. And then once you're done with that, you say we want to change this functionality now, and so you write tests uh, that will allow you to change the functionality. Right? That's, that's the general scheme of things. All of this is easier said than done and requires a lot of creativity. That many of the people who may be in the managers or their CIOs, they're not necessarily software engineers. Nonetheless, they have taken on the burden uh, project. The things that Mark was just talking about, I would like to say it's not necessarily your personal job to figure those things out. It is your job to ask your software engineers to figure out a way to do it. You do not have to have the vision to exactly evolve your legacy system into a working system. You should say to your engineers, Mr. Ms. Engineer, 